So, welcome to our weekly Bible study. This is Exodus. This is the Exodus story, part 5, Exodus chapter 4. But before we get to Exodus part 5, the Exodus story part 5, before we get to chapter 4, we're going to start with a question from a listener about last week's study from Exodus chapter 3. So if you open your Bible to Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. If you start in verse 1, just go back one verse to Exodus 3, verse 22, and we'll just start there. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor, and her that sojourns in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold, and raiment, and you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you shall spoil the Egyptians. And so the listener from last week asks... Why does the King James use the term borrow in the description God gives of Israel spoiling the Egyptians? Certainly God knew they would not be returning the gold and the silver and the jewels and the clothing that were going to be expropriated at a moment of ex extreme duress. Is this God or Moses being dishonest in the record? Were the, were the women of Israel dishonest? And, and, or is this just a poor translation? So that's our question from a listener from last week. And, of course, the modern Bible scholar will say that this is an, this is an example of the inferiority of the old King James, which they're always sure to call it the old King James. Um, and they'll point to the modern translations, of course, as superior. But in reality, the use of the term borrow here is an example to the modern scholar of other people's superior scholarship. And we should point out, by the way, that the King James also uses the term borrow in Exodus 11.2 and Exodus 12.35, all three verses describing the same event. And just to be sure, we'll just quickly go to Exodus chapter 11 and verse 2. Exodus 11 verse 2. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And then Exodus uh, 12, 35. Exodus 12 and verse 35. Again, talking about the same event as it occurred. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. Raiment, by the way, means clothing. Suits of clothing, actually. Clothing was very expensive and valuable in those days. So here we have three verses all describing the same event, all using the term borrow. And so the fact is that you and I and most Bible scholars are simply not as well educated as the men who translated the English Bible 400 years ago. We're familiar with the word borrow only in the sense of a loan. At least that's, what, that's the way I understood it. When I heard the question, when I read the question, I was like, huh, I wonder why that is, because I only know borrow as a loan. But if you go to Webster's 1828, we read the first definition of borrow, to take from another by requesting consent with a view to use the thing taken for a time and then return it or the equivalent if the thing is to be consumed. That's how we all know uh, borrow. Second definition, to take from another for one's own use, to occupy or select from the writings of another author as to borrow a passage from a printed book or to borrow a title. The third definition of the word borrow, to take or adopt for one's own use sentiments, principles, doctrines, and the like as to borrow instruction. And then the fourth definition, to take for use something that belongs to another. To assume, copy, or imitate is to borrow a shape, to borrow a manner of another, or to borrow a style of writing. So to take for use something that belongs to another. Um, you know, one could say that English is a rich language because it borrows so many words from other languages, right? But you have no intention on returning those words. You've borrowed them. And so, and you've borrowed to enrich yourself, to take for you something that belongs to another. And this is the sense in which the Hebrews will be taking from the Egyptians. 
Israel is going to expropriate items from a foreign source in order to enrich themselves. And so in the full context of the event, the old King James is actually the more sophisticated translation. Modern translations use the term ask. Ask, which does not convey the entire context of expropriation from a foreign source for enrichment. Uh, but ask is easier to read. Um, and I agree that I agree that the presence of the word borrow makes the initial reading a, a little more difficult to understand. It, it's, it's a little confusing. It's, it's even got the dogs going crazy. It was so confusing. The dogs were gone wild. Okay. Um, so it makes the initial reading a bit more difficult. But that's not because the translation is inferior. It's because modern education is inferior to that of the translators. <laughs> so we've obviously got some sort of livestock event occurring outside. So, or there's about to be an earthquake or a meteor impact and the dogs are aware of it. So you better hold on, hold on to your seat. Okay. Um, so again, um, ask is easier to read, but it's not really as descriptive. And in my opinion, we would do well to study questions like this out instead of updating the verbiage to accommodate the modern dumbed down education that we've all received. Better to study. All right, now we'll go right to our text for tonight, Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, and we will start in verse 1. Exodus 4, 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord has not appeared to you. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it to the ground. And he cast it to the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth your hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now your hand into your bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put your hand into your bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as the other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe you, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto your voice, that you shall take of the waters of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which you take out of the river shall become blood on the dry land. So, here we have Moses resisting God's call. And so, God begins demonstrating the signs he'll use to convince not only Moses to answer his call, but to convince the elders of the children of Israel that God has indeed visited him and sent him. Um, but God doesn't argue with Moses that, that they will believe. He doesn't say, don't worry, Moses, they'll believe you. I've given you my name. Um, he, he, he doesn't say, you know, I've, I've given you my name, Yahweh. I've given the name, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Surely they'll believe. God doesn't argue that. God knows that simply coming in the name of God will not be enough and they'll have to be convinced by signs and wonders. We have to keep in mind there, there was no printed Bible, there, there was no scripture, and there was no, there was no widespread revelation like we have today. And so God gives Moses these two or three witnesses. And another thing I noticed is that God doesn't tell Moses that there's another way out. That if they don't believe, if they don't believe the first sign, the second sign, the third sign, then okay, Moses, then I release you from your obligation. You don't have to lead the children out of the land of Israel. And you can just go back, go on about, go back to Midian and 
and drive your flock to the backside of the desert. He doesn't give him that option. Um, Moses doesn't realize it yet, but God has already determined that Moses will do this. In fact, we're going to see that Moses does not realize that his, his fate has already been decided. It's been predestined, so to speak. So let's go back to the text in verse, starting in verse 10. And then Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore since, or since have you spoken unto your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. And he said, O oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him who thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he comes forth to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. And you shall speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do, and he shall be your spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to you instead of a mouth, and you shall be to him instead of God. And you shall take this rod in your hand, wherewith you shall do signs. <clears throat> and so Moses there confirms what I asserted in the last chapter last week, that up until now Moses and God had not communicated. We tend to think of Moses as this great and powerful character of faith played by Charlton Heston in the old movie. But as you read the actual text, he comes across as reticent, I would say fearful, even to the point of, of cowardly. And he doesn't come across as spiritually inclined toward God at all. To the point where God starts to even get angry at his reticence, right? Um, but unlike me, when God gets angry, he does not sin. In fact, he goes above and beyond. And God's interaction with Moses here is an example of the attitude that we should aspire to when we're interacting with others. We all need to be more patient and more accommodating to each other's weaknesses and fears. And when we do get angry, and when we do sin, <laughs> we have to recognize that we cannot achieve the righteous requirement that God achieves every single time. And that we are completely dependent upon Him for holiness in this life, any righteousness that we do, and, and certainly totally dependent on Him for salvation. God is long-suffering. And so instead of just dismissing Moses and moving on to another man to answer his call, God patiently works with Moses to get him to a place where he can be of some value and of some use to God. And he offers Moses to take a helper with him, his, his older brother Aaron. And, and then God reminds him of the rod, to, he's, as if to say, like, did you see me turn that rod into a serpent, by the way? Did you miss that part? Take, take the rod. <laughs> Are you paying attention here? Uh, did I mention, by the way, that I am God? I'm the almighty God, by the way. So in addition to your older brother, Aaron, he'll help you. But I, I'll help you too. And I'm the almighty, everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. But okay, I'll send your brother. And by the way, take the rod. Did you notice I turned that into a serpent? Anyway. All right. Um, and by the way now, in providing for Aaron to help Moses, God is acknowledging a reality that men need a man to follow. In the garden, Adam had the Son. The Son of God dwelt in the garden on earth in a human form, like a man. And so it seems that we were designed not only for fellowship with one another, 
but for fellowship with a leader in the form of a man. So that man was the Son of God in the original creation. And until God, until God could provide that same man for our leadership again, we were predisposed to depend on other fallen men for leadership. It's not the optimum situation, but it seems unavoidable. And even today, even though we have the example of the man Jesus Christ, we can't see him. And so we long for a strong leader, a man to lead us. And so this is how charlatans and dictators rise, because... The people are designed to want a man to lead them. Again, not the optimum situation, but apparently unavoidable. Now, when Moses complains that he's not a good public speaker, God says to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, some say that this is evidence that God makes deaf people, mute people, and blind people disabled. I read a a, a, a famous preacher, I'm not going to name him, but someone that you've all heard of, I read four or five pages of him struggling with this and coming to the conclusion that now that he knows that God makes people disabled, his faith in God is actually stronger because he's able to have faith in something he can't understand, and that's a more better faith because he can't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to him. So, is that what God's saying here? Is that He creates people disabled? That God disables people? And that we just can't understand it? It's for a purpose that's greater than we can comprehend? And if we can have faith in God anyway, that'll mean we have stronger faith. Is that what this means? I think that's just a, a shallow interpretation of God's obvious reference here. God's saying, what God is saying here to Moses is, is that he's intimately familiar with even severe, severe disabilities. He knows all about those. He's like, Moses, I know all about deaf and dumb. I know all about can't speak. Okay? Don't try to cop out of this job with that nonsense because I know what that is. That your mouth works just fine. That's what God is saying to Moses here. He's not saying that he creates disabled people for some mysterious purpose that we can't comprehend. People are disabled because we live in a fallen world. Why do bad things happen in a fallen world? Because if God were to intervene, it would be the end of everything. And so, because God is long-suffering, unfortunately that means suffering is allowed in the world until God decides to move on to the next phase. But he's just telling Moses to stop whining. Your mouth works fine. Now, the attitude of insufficiency that's expressed here by Moses, that can be compared to what Paul will later call the beggarly elements of the law in Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians, Paul calls the law that Moses is about to deliver to Israel here in the book of Exodus, the law that Cecil B. DeMille named his movie after, the Ten Commandments, right? Paul calls that law beggarly. And so now we have to go back to Webster's Dictionary for the word beggarly, because who knows what the word beggarly means? I wasn't sure what the word beggarly means. Uh, from Webster's be beggarly, in the condition of a beggar, extremely indig indigent, e extremely indigent, which of course sent me looking up the word indigent, right? <laughs> because I matriculated in the public schools. So indigent, according to Webster's 1828, destitute of property or means of comfortable subsistence, needy, poor. So Paul is calling the law lousy, beggarly. In fact, let's just read it. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9, if you want to go there. We'll see what Paul says about the law that Moses is being prepared to deliver to the children of Israel after he leads them out of slavery in Egypt, Moses is going to give them a law. And Paul addresses the law in Galatians chapter 4. And he does it in the ninth verse, Galatians 4, 9. Paul says to the Galatian believers, But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, 
How turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. And so it's, it's the observance of days and times and years. I mean, that's going to be one of the main features that Moses is being called here to deliver to Israel. Moses is about to institute the Passover, which is observance of a day and a month and a year. It's an observance, by the way, which Paul will be discouraging later among the Galatian believers. So people who say there's always only been one gospel, well, reconcile that. Anyway, um, just as Moses was lacking in his ability to save Israel out of Egypt, the law that he would give them was inadequate to save them from eternal damnation. But as we pointed out back in our study through Romans, God had to give the law. He had to give the law in order to meet every accusation that might be brought against him. God was obligated to demonstrate the law's inadequacy to save man. God was obligated to do that. And by the way, he also demonstrated man's inadequacy since no one ever kept the law perfectly. No mortal man. The giving of the law, by the way, was also along the same lines as God being thorough in his dealings with Pharaoh. Remember last week? We asked, why did, why did God tell Moses to tell Pharaoh, let us go three days journey? Well, it's because God was giving Pharaoh every opportunity to repent. So just as God gave Pharaoh every opportunity, God would give all mankind every opportunity. So that on judgment day, every mouth shall be stopped and all the world stand guilty before God. And no one will be able to say, But what if you had done this? Or what if you had done that? Because God's going to say, I tried that. And I tried that. And I tried more. I tried everything. I met all my obligations. And you, oh man, are without excuse. Okay, now we'll return to the text. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 18. Exodus 4, 18. Exodus 4.18, And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law. And he said unto him, Let me go, I pray, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought your life. And Moses took his wife and his sons, and he set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When you go to return into Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart, and he shall not let the people go. And you shall say unto Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go... Behold, I will slay your son, even your firstborn. So, why does Moses tell Jethro he wants to see if his brethren are still alive in Egypt? God just told Moses that he's going to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. So Moses knows there are Hebrews alive in Egypt, right? So why does Moses not simply tell Jethro what God told him? Hey, Jethro, I have to go back to Egypt. I have to lead the children of Israel out of slavery. How come he's just not straight with Jethro? Okay, well, let's keep in mind that Moses has now been a part of Jethro's family for 40 years. Jethro has come to rely on Moses to keep his flock. And Moses has his grandchildren, and he's married to his daughter. So Moses leaving would have to be for a serious reason and a reason that would not offend Jethro. So Moses referred to his own family back in Egypt. Notice he said, my brethren. 
So he told Jethro he desired to see if his own relatives were still alive. So, of course, Jethro consented. And as to why Moses didn't tell Jethro about God's plan to liberate Israel, well, for one thing, it seems like Moses isn't really convinced that that's even going to happen. Um, Moses is still a bit unconvinced. Second, if Moses was convinced that, uh, that God had a plan and that God would execute that plan, um, neither Moses nor God would want an outsider knowing about it. So whether Jethro is a pagan or a believer at this point, he's certainly not a part of God's plan for Moses and Israel. And loose lips sink ships. And three can keep a secret if two of them are dead, right? So if Moses tells Jethro, Jethro lets it slip to a servant, and then before you know it, it's in, it's in Pharaoh's ear back in Egypt. So that's why Moses wasn't obligated to tell Jethro. And now, if you go back to verses 19 through 23, by the way, these appear to be a departure from the chronological narrative. And instead, verses 19 through 23 provide a broader overview of events. There's a communication from God for Moses to go to Egypt. Then Moses prepares his wife and his children for the journey. Then God reiterates the necessity of the miracles, and he reveals to Moses that he's prepared to afflict Pharaoh even to the killing of his firstborn son. So there seems to be a... like many written accounts there's the chronological narrative but then there's also over we'll back off get an overview of events and that's the way things are written so that they're comprehensible it's not unusual at all so now we'll go to verse 24 and we'll pick up the text again in exodus 4 24 and it came to pass by the way in the end that the lord met him and sought to kill him then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art you to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Now, it's <clears throat> so verse 24 where we started and it came to pass, by the way, at the end. Verse 24 is a return to the chronological narrative. And it appears that Moses parted ways with Zipporah and his two sons after this circumcision incident. Um, Zipporah will not be mentioned again until we encounter her journeying from Midian to see Moses with her father in Exodus 18 after the children have come out of Egypt. And so what's going on here with this? Moses apparently left Midian without circumcising his newborn son. And the fact that here he didn't circumcise the boy himself, that his wife Zipporah had to do it, and that she did it not with a blade, but with a sharp stone, and then she calls Moses a bloody husband. These are all interesting details, right, that might help us understand what is a very, very short description of what seems to be a very major event, right? So why did God seek to kill Moses over the uncircumcised child? Well, God had commanded Abraham back in Genesis 17, quote, And the uncircumcised man whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Genesis 17, 14. And since an infant is not responsible, God sought to punish Moses for the transgression. And when God said cut off back in Genesis chapter 17, cut off means killed. And so God could apparently suffer Moses' apprehension about not speaking well and not going to Egypt and nobody's going to believe me. God was willing to work with him and all that, but not the transgression of the command to circumcise. God was not giving any quarter on that, and he sought to kill Moses. And it appears that the angel of the Lord was physically assaulting or restraining Moses, preventing him from circumcising the child. And it, it appears that the angel of the Lord was about to kill Moses. But Zipporah intervened using a makeshift tool 
this sharp stone, and then throwing the foreskin at the feet of him. Who's him? I think it's the executioner. She threw the foreskin at the feet of him, and he let him go. She, she threw the foreskin of the child at the feet of the angel of the Lord, who then let Moses go. And when she says Moses is a bloody husband to her, what does she mean by that? Well, notice that the author says it twice by way of clarification. He says it twice to clarify the order of events. When he restates Zipporah's exclamation a second time, he says, a bl he says and then she said, a bloody husband are you to me because of the circumcision. So that's how it goes when we read it that second time. So it appears Moses is saying, Moses is the author, by the way, he's writing all this down. It appears that Moses is saying that she's upset that now she has had to commit with the, the infant Eleazar the same circumcision that Moses had performed on their first son, Gershom, back in Midian. Moses had circumcised his firstborn Gershom back in Midian, and she found the act repulsive. She did not like it. There was a long-standing argument about it. She didn't like it. And that's probably why it hadn't happened yet, because Moses didn't want to fight anymore about it. And now, because Moses is about to be killed for it, now she's been forced into circumcising just as her husband had done the thing she didn't want to do, the thing she hated and found disgusting. She had to actually do it, and so she was mad about it. And so that's why she says, you're a bloody husband to me. Together, we've done this now. So anyway, and at this point, Moses appears to send Zipporah and the children back to Midian, or he leaves them at the inn, and they end up back at Midian. Either way, they parted ways, and Moses continues on to Egypt. And so now we'll return to the text. I don't understand. You don't understand? Yes. God told Moses to circumcise his children on the eighth day. Yep. Uh huh. But then after that, yep. He was going to kill him. He was going to kill him when he realized he hadn't circumcised his son. Why is that? Because God was going to kill him because he realized he hadn't circumcised his son. And it's quite possible that Eleazar is a newborn. And it's quite possible that on the eighth day or the ninth, so at the time God revealed to Moses that he was going to do all these miracles, it wasn't an issue. It became an issue later when the child was not circumcised, and so God was going to kill him. Yeah, because Gershom was mentioned earlier, and only one son was mentioned earlier, but now there's two all of a sudden. So it seems like Eleazar was just born. And quite possibly this was, how did God find out he didn't circumcise? Because God watched him and the day went by and it didn't happen. That's quite possible. And God was going to insist that it was going to happen. Or he was going to kill Moses. Yes. Um, and so now we return to the text in verse 27. Verse 27. <clears throat> Exodus 4, 27, And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and he met him in the mount of God. And he kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words that the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses. And he did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. So, Aaron goes out to meet Moses at Mount Sinai, at the Mount of God, it says. So is this during the same trip as the burning bush event? Or has Moses come a second time to the mountain? Well, we're not told specifically that Moses stopped a second time on his way from Midian to Egypt. 
although that's possible. But the previous mention of Aaron earlier in this chapter was during a chronological narrative, and it seemed to imply that Aaron was already on his way to meet Moses. In fact, let's go back <clears throat> where um, in verse 14, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know he can speak well, and also, behold, he comes forth to meet you. So this is during the chronological narrative, and it implies that Aaron was on his way to meet Moses, and Moses was in Mount Sinai. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so it seemed to imply he was already on his way to meet him back there in 14. Um, and notice in this section, by the way, verse 27 through the end of the chapter, does not begin with a chronological indicator, like, and then the Lord said, or it starts with, and the Lord said to Aaron. So this is another, I think, this, this section reads like, like verses 19 through 23. It feels more like an overview of events separated now from the chronological narrative. Because we'll see when the next section starts in the next chapter, it appears to be a return to the chronological narrative with uses of the words like then or afterward. So this is more of an overview. But before we get to the next chapter, which we'll go there next week, notice that Moses and Aaron indeed, they have to not only speak the words, tell God's name, but they also have to do the signs. Just as Moses had suspected, just as God knew, the people would not believe just Moses' word or that Moses had received a, re a revelation of the name of God. The text says they believed what Moses told them. They believed that the Lord had visited them, that he had seen their affliction. But the text does not imply that they trusted the Lord. It says they bowed their heads and worshiped, but it does not say specifically that they worshiped the Lord. And I think that's significant. We tend to ascribe a certain level of faith to characters in the Bible, especially characters who are involved in the most monumental stories, and especially the characters who saw all the most monumental miracles. We tend to ascribe to them a monumental amount of faith. But as we continue the story of Exodus, it will become clear that ascribing faithfulness to the children of Israel is almost always a mistake. Here the text says that they believe the fact of the Lord's visitation. But did they really trust Him? They believe the signs. But did the signs produce enduring faith? They produced worship, but of who? Of what? Perhaps it was true worship of the living God for a time. Perhaps. Perhaps it was mostly just worship of the power of the signs. Because as we continue the story, we'll see that the signs and wonders that Israel is about to see day after day after day for 40 years, the most monumental signs and wonders in the whole Bible, they do not produce faith. And they don't produce an enduring trust in God. And we'll look more into that as we get into chapter 5 next week. Until then, may the grace of God go with you. And may the peace of Jesus Christ be upon you. Let's pray. Thank you again, Lord, for your example of Moses and the children of Israel, Lord, and how looking back on this story can help us understand you and your salvation by your Son, Jesus Christ, and His blood for whom we are thankful forever, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.